Posse Audio sent me their SP601 bookshelf speaker after I saw them at Expona about two months ago. I don't like giving bad reviews. It's not fun. I don't do it for clickbait, but I am honest and I'll just be straightforward when I say that I don't like these speakers. When I fire them up and did my typical place them near the wall, bring them out from the wall, sit them this far apart, point them inward, point them outward, no matter what I did, I didn't like them. And for the first time in a very long time, I was really confused as to what I'm hearing. Most of the time when I listen to speakers, I'm, I don't want to say like I'm pretty good at spotting issues, but the issues are maybe a couple here or there and like all speakers there's always trade-offs and that's why there is no perfect speaker but they're easy enough to identify oh there's a little bit of sibilance here or maybe the mid-range is kind of missing some detail or some warmth or uh, clarity maybe the hi-hat sounds a little bit too bright uh, maybe the mid bass doesn't have enough punch or something like that but you can usually say yeah these are the things that kind of stand out maybe in a good way but also in a bad way with this particular speaker I couldn't figure it out. I listened and listened and I was just perplexed. And I honestly thought maybe I had one of the wires connected improperly. So I got up and went to the speaker, flipped the polarity of one of the wires and went and sat back down. And I said, oh, that wasn't it because then the sound stage just went boom uh, and you lost all sorts of focus in imaging. So that told me right away that it wasn't a polarity problem. So I got back up, switched the wires back around, sat back down and continue to listen more and more. And I really tried to figure out what it was that just didn't sit right with me about these speakers. And ultimately I gave up. Only after I saw the measurements did it kind of make sense. There's just a lot of things going on with this speaker that are not right. The mid range is cut. The upper mid range has a little bit of a dip and that's okay. That doesn't really bother me so much. The high frequency is extremely boosted around the four to six K region, which is going to be very sharp and sibilant. And then the bass rolls off at around 70 Hertz or so in room. In my listening, the sibilance didn't stand out to me like the data would show. Uh, the mid range cut didn't stand out to me like the data would show. And even the upper mid range cut didn't stand out quite as much. And the reason for that is because they were all doing their own thing. Now, if you had just one of these issues and the rest of the speaker was you know, pretty good, pretty nominal, neutral for the most part, but maybe one thing stood out, then okay, yeah, that, that's the easiest spot. So when I saw the measurements, I went back and said, all right, well, let's try some things with EQ and see if that really fixes it for me and gets me back to a baseline that for me would be acceptable. So I did that. I put some EQ around 400 Hertz, brought it up about two to three decibels. I didn't touch the cut in the upper mid range, but for the high frequency, I have EQ band at about 4K and I brought that down about three decibels. And I went and sat back down and I toggled through my app on and off. Which one do I like? My dog just sneezed. Which one do I like? Oh, speaking of dogs, this video is proudly brought to you by myself, Earth Rated. If you are like me, you have a dog that has ear infection issues. I have now had five, five golden retrievers. I have had a couple labs, I've had a collie and a German Shepherd. Every single dog that I have had has had some sort of issue with ear infections. Now, it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized you have to clean their ears properly. And to be honest, sometimes I got lazy and just didn't get around to it. Part of the problem is because, you know, you have to squirt a little bit of something in the ear and then grab a Kleenex or something to clean it out. Now, maybe I'm an asshole for not taking care of my dog the way I should have, but recently I bought a pack of these. 70 count pack, about $12 via Amazon, and I will put an affiliate link at the bottom of this video. They are very dog friendly. My dog has no issue with me squirm my ear or my finger around his ear to clean up all that dirt. And as you can see in this video, he takes to it well, and they do an excellent job of getting the ears cleaned. Since I've started using this product without any additional medication, my dog's floppy ear syndrome has essentially gone away. So if you have a dog that has an ear infection issue or you really want to just stay ahead of it, consider purchasing Earth Rated Pet Wipes. This video is not sponsored by them. I am literally making this up as I go. Decided to do it today. We'll have an affiliate link. If you want to support the channel, that will be 
what's 4% of $11? Let's, 40, let's just say it's 50 cents. I'm going to make 50 cents off that purchase if you buy them. So keep that in mind. Now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. The issue when I listened to these speakers was that so much was wrong that it was hard for me to tell what I didn't like. So with the equalization applied, I went and sat back down and I thought, okay, that's a lot more to my liking. It wasn't perfect, but at least it told me that the things that I saw on the data were a point in the right direction as to how I go about correcting the response of this speaker. Now let's talk about specs. This is a two-way in-room bookshelf speaker with a six and a half inch paper inner cone with aluminum alloy outer layer. It features a one and a half inch silk dome tweeter. Spec power is 80 watt RMS, nominal impedance four ohm, sensitivity rated at 85 decibels. Now we're gonna do the sound clip. The point of this is to not tell you how the speaker sounds through your speakers or your headphones. It's simply to give you a basis for comparison. I use regular pink noise and then I use convolved pink noise with the speaker's response essentially overlaid. The further you get from the original pink noise, the more nonlinear, the less transparent and the less accurate this speaker will be. So let's do that. Now let's look at the data. Average sensitivity measured is about 85.4 decibels. F3 is at 59 Hertz, F10 is at 40 Hertz. So this speaker should get down to, I would say 60, 70 Hertz in most rooms. You will still need a subwoofer if you want really good kick drum, punch you in the chest, bass authority. You can see this big scoop through this mid range right here. That makes all the vocals sound very hollow. And that's about three decibels or so compared to the mean. The upper mid range area is boosted by about one and a half decibels or so that can make it sound a little bit forward. And then that's followed by a dip in the upper, upper mid range that can cause the speaker to sound a little bit more recessed, but smack in the middle of that recess is another little bit of a bump. Now, as you go higher in frequency between about four to six or seven kilohertz or so, you've got about a three to four decibel bump in that sibilant region. So the S's and the t -t -t sounds are gonna be very sharp and edgy. And then you come back down to something that's kind of overall more reasonable. Because of this profile, this dip, boost, dip, boost, dip, big boost, that is exactly why I could not figure out what it was about the speaker that I didn't like. Now, the best thing that I can relate this to is my experience with the Triangle Borea I think it's the BR03. Now that's a speaker that many people like and has been received well by, uh, by other reviewers. And I just didn't like the speaker. And the reason I didn't like the speaker is because while it was within about plus or minus three decibels, it was bouncing all over that place. I mean, from, from about hundred Hertz to about 10 kilohertz. And because of that inconsistency in response, it sounded like a very unnatural speaker. This is the CEA 2034 data set, and this gives you an idea of many things, but in particular for a speaker of this price, even if it's nonlinear, can you equalize it? Okay, well, yeah, you can. You can bring up the mid-range area because this is somewhat linear through here, although it's not without resonance. And then as you go higher in frequency, yeah, you can still EQ this speaker, but there's a strong diffraction dip around, I think this is like 4K that creates issues, and then it peaks up around here. So you're gonna have issues trying to equalize this particular area. I think your best bet is gonna be using sidewall panel absorption. You don't have to have panel absorption for every speaker. Some speakers benefit from it and some speakers actually perform worse. This is the estimated in-room response. And this is my best guess at how I overall heard the speaker. Burst decay shows some minor resonances, but overall, you know, I'm okay with these. This particular one, uh, around four to five kilohertz or so, kind of lingers on, but it's also 27 decibels down. This particular area lingers for about three cycles, and that's about 20 decibels down or so. Overall, I don't think that this is something that you're really going to hear, but it does show that there are some decay issues. The horizontal contour plot. This area right through here, this big swag right through here, this is why I say that you need panel absorption for these speakers if you wanna make it sound more natural, more neutral overall. So as the speaker fires out into the room and hits the sidewalls, this will be reflected stronger 
than the direct sound in this two to about seven kilohertz region. All those sounds that are hitting that wall come back stronger than the direct sound that you hear. So equalizing something like that is gonna be practically impossible. You might be able to get some semblance of something that you like, but you're not gonna get it dialed in exactly like you want. So I do recommend side panel absorption to fix that issue because it cannot be resolved via EQ. Vertical axis, you can go about five degrees above the tweeter, maybe about 20 degrees below the tweeter. So stay at the tweeter level. Harmonic distortion, 86 decibels, it looks all right. And then at 96 decibels, now you may be thinking to yourself, wow, this distortion actually looks pretty good. But remember, through the mid range, this speaker has already cut about three decibels. So if I tested this at 99 decibels, I would expect that this particular distortion component, uh, the second distortion component would probably hit above 3%. Multi-tone distortion shows some issues in the upper mid-range area, and this is right where our ears are most sensitive, and this creates a problem. So at low volumes, I didn't really have much of an issue. At higher volumes, I definitely noticed more edge and more graininess to the speaker. Now, it could have been just the upper treble boost area that I was talking about earlier, but because I didn't notice it so much in lower volume, that makes me think what I was hearing was the distortion in that area at higher volume. If you cross the speaker at 80 Hertz and treat it like you're going to put a subwoofer on it, you do lower distortion, but it's not a whole lot. And it is through the lower mid range, not so much the upper mid range. Long-term compression, you're going to max out at about 95 decibels or so for this speaker, but that's for one speaker. So you can get louder with a pair in a room. And then for short-term dynamic compression, uh, we see a lot of issues. Now for a speaker this size at this price point, the 102 decibel dynamic range that doesn't really bother me. I see this all the time with lower cost speakers, especially bookshelf size speakers. The one that does make me go, ooh, is this right here through this crossover region and this peaking of distortion right here. So this makes me think that we have an issue with, and this is my guess, that you have an issue with distortion of the tweeter and then you have an issue with compression on the mid bass or mid woofer driver. And it could potentially be some crossover saturation of the crossover components as well. But again, that's just a guess. The impedance shows a lot of resonances. And one thing I will say is that this enclosure sounds quite hollow. Now I did not take it apart, but I did poke a flashlight in there. And from what I can tell, there isn't any batting. If there is, it's below the port. If you tap on the side of the speaker, which isn't necessarily a most foolproof way of determining how resonant the speaker is, but it's, you know, it's reasonable. If you tap on it, you can definitely hear some extra resonance from inside the enclosure. It looks like it probably needs some more bracing, uh, definitely some additional filling. If there isn't any already, uh, then it definitely needs some period. But yeah, this enclosure itself is also quite resonant. And that does it for this review. I wanna thank Fozzy Audio for sending me this pair of speakers on loan to review. If you like what you see here, please take the time to like, subscribe, hit the thumbs up, leave a comment. That definitely helps with the algorithm. And if you'd like to support my channel, you can do so one of a couple different ways. So first of all, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. There'll be a link in the description below. There you can get behind the scenes information. We can talk via PM directly. You can ask questions there. You get updated on what's coming down the pipeline. And sometimes I share videos that will never meet the uh, public eye. Another way is to use, yeah, the, uh, use my generic affiliate links to Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Target, et cetera, et cetera. They're all generic. If you wanna buy anything from these online stores, you just go click my generic link in the description below and that will take you to the store and then you just buy whatever it is that you want and I will earn a commission for it. And as I said earlier, if you've got a pet, even a cat probably works with cat ears. And I'm not a vet, so I have to throw that disclaimer out there in case somebody does something stupid. I'm not responsible. But if you are a responsible adult who isn't a moron, then yeah, check these things <laughs> check these things out. They definitely help. They're a real quick solution for cleaning your dog's ears without making a mess. And you can toss them when you're done. And with all that said, I'm out. I'll talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.